Hello and welcome to another episode of the Global Wire Conversation. Today I'll be talking to Professor Eric Kaufmann. He's a professor of politics at Birbeck College at the University of London. He's a specialist on nationalism, political demography, and religious demography. He has authored and co-authored multiple books dealing with these topics. Today we'll be talking about the shy Trump vote and what's the evidence for its existence, political correctness, self-censorship on universities, and the future of migration in Europe and the United States. Allow me to start with a kind of one my 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 first question, and which particularly drew my attention to your most recent writings, and that's the question regarding the so-called shy Trump vote. So, based on what we know of the 2020 election so far, what can be said of that phenomenon? Well, um, it's very interesting. Obviously, the polls were off uh, this election, but also they were off by more than the 2016 election, which people were surprised by. So you, I think, had about, on the popular vote, a miss of about one and a half points last time, and it's it's more like five points this time. So uh, it's it's a bigger scale miss. Um, the other thing too is, if you look at the uh, demographic breaks and, and where the polls missed worse this time, I thought it was interesting that in particular, it was white, college-educated voters that uh, the polls got wrong very heavily. So something, if you looked at the sort of pre-election analyses, uh, I think they had this group, you know, basically the, the group came out about three points for Biden in the end. And if you looked at the pre-election analyses, a lot of them had them, you know, 20 to 25 points for Biden. Uh, and I think that's quite revealing. Whereas if you take the white non-college-educated group, Yes, they had them wrong, but they didn't have them wrong by that much. And, and I think that sort of matches with a, a narrative that was prevailing, which was that, well, you know, intelligent people uh, pe pe are offended by Trump and therefore uh, are not going to vote for him. And it's only the dumb people, essentially, that will will continue to vote for him, and, and particularly the white dumb people, because they're kind of racist. And what. OK, so really what happened was that we saw this the group of white college voters really defy the polls the most. And I kind of, you know, one of the things you, we know uh, is that if you, there was a survey done by Cato that looked at whether people felt comfortable sharing their political views with friends uh, and, and at work. And it showed that uh, the share of white college graduates who said that they would, they feared for their job or for their career if their views became known is, is highest by far amongst um, white college graduate Republican supporters. Uh, so something like 60% of, of um, white Republicans with a postgraduate qualification, like a master's or PhD said they would be afraid for their views to become known. And only about 20, 22% percent of, of Democrats with those qualifications. So there you have a group that really is very sort of shy uh, about revealing their opinion. Now, the question is, if a pollster calls up, um, who is going to pick up the phone? Since we know as few as 1% of people answer that phone call, um, who are the people who are not answering the phone call? And if there's any systematic bias, in who answers that phone call, then you're gonna get a skew in the polls. And of course, what the pollsters have done is they assumed, okay, well, yes, we're not gonna get as many uh, white non-college people, people with just a grade school education. So we're gonna weight our responses by the share of the population that's made up of white grade school voters. And then no problem, we've got our survey uh, accurate. Uh, but the problem is, and, and this is something that I've just noticed in, in doing work on the election studies is if you try and predict who was a Trump voter just based on demographics, you get a very lousy model. You, you could predict a few percentage points of the variation. Uh, but if you include any attitudinal question, attitudes to the death penalty, attitudes to illegal immigration, suddenly you have a very strong prediction. And, and this holds equally within the universe. So you can just have a sample of university graduates. And if you look at the sample of university graduates, um, you see a huge variation. And so most of the variation is within these demographics, not between them. So these polls effectively are missing because they're ignoring the invisible things which really determine the vote. 
and they're focusing on the visible things like race and class and education, which are much less important. Do you think there might have been something also like a, some some form of like unconscious bias on part, maybe not so much the pollsters, but the news outlets that reported on the polls? I mean, we know that Trafalgar was somewhat closer. There was, I mean, they 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 were were kind of betting that the election go all the way for Trump, but at least they were closer in, in, in some of the swing states. And I think insider advantage was also significantly closer. So do you think that was exactly what you said, that it was on the one hand, old techniques, but maybe also a little bit, uh, uh, bias is of course a strong word, but a, a little bit of wishful thinking as well. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting. You're right that those pollsters that got it right were discounted because they were seen as kind of partisan Republican pollsters. Um, but the other thing, which is a question I, you would take research to figure out is, is actually, if you took all of the polls that were run and you looked at their demographic breaks, are there pollsters who found that white college voters actually weren't favoring Biden that much, who, who simply didn't publish those breaks? I don't know the answer to that, but that would be what we call a file drawer problem where Something that didn't fit the narrative is not published. Now, I, I have no idea. Maybe, maybe not. I suspect that it's more this kind of reluctance amongst people being contacted to answer a poll. But it would be interesting if someone did that study and went through, contacted all the pollsters, got their data, and actually crunched it to see whether there was a reporting bias problem. Because, I mean, I noticed this in the 2016 election. There were polls, for example, saying that um, Clinton had 30 to 40 points advantage amongst white college women uh, over Trump. Now, we know the actual final tally was, I think it was pretty close. I don't mm -hmm. even remember, but it was, it was pretty even. But the fact you had polls, so I wonder if there were other polls that found much less of a difference, simply didn't make it into the media. So, yeah, that's a separate issue that probably takes some investigating. So, but do you think it would be safe to say that something like the, the as it's called the shy Trump vote, it is a phenomenon that that actually does exist because there has been some reporting that it has been overblown and and but I think from the data we have now available, it can be said with quite some certainty, yes, right? There have been people, particularly college educated uh, individuals. I think you also pointed out in some of your writings, this is even more true for female college educated uh, individuals. That yeah, they, it seems like their voting behavior was different than to what they revealed or the way they were weighted in um, in in previous uh, survey techniques. Yes, I I think so. I think I'm, what I'm not 100 percent sure of in my mind is okay. So they've done things like compare telephone polls to online polls, assuming that online people would not be reluctant to reveal their opinion, and they've shown no difference. And I think that's important. Um, but it's not the whole story. So there's a, there's a couple of things going on. One is what's called reactance, which is people resent the pollsters more, right? So, um, and this is what Frank Luntz, who is the Republican pollsters, was saying that a, a lot of respondents, uh, you know, associate polls with the media and being biased and everything. Um, and that is quite important. If you look at trust in the media, for example, amongst Republican voters, it's dropped between 2015 and 2017, it sort of dropped 20 points. Trust in academia dropped 30 points. You know, so you have this phenomenon of not just not wanting to reveal your opinions, but being resentful that you're being suppressed and therefore being even less likely to reveal it. And I think both of these things are in play. Um, and this is one of the reasons perhaps it's worse, the bias problem might be worse this time, is you have had that drop in trust on the Trump's voter side. Um, so yeah, I think this is something that the pollsters will have to take seriously. I think the pollsters are well-intentioned in the sense that they want to get it right. So I don't think they're deliberately playing with us, but I do think that there is a problem insofar as the, the people that they're trying to reach have a reactance issue or a low trust issue. And, and actually that's been, a, you know, even in Vox, you'll see they, yeah. David Shore in that interview more or less said, yes, we, we now understand it's not enough to wait by uh, demographics. We're missing systematically the low trusting voter. Um, and we don't, don't know how to get around that problem. So it's now it's more or less now been admitted this is a systematic error. Be interesting to see if they do anything about it. 
There's uh, one other thing about the election that that I think is probably going to be interesting. Also, how it reflects on the on the average voter, maybe particularly the the conservative voter, is uh, one of the great surprises has been the performance of Republican candidates down ballot. Right, initially there was the expectation, then in addition to Joe Biden winning the presidency, that Democrats will come very close, if not outright. Uh, they will be taking over the Senate and that they will make gains in the House of Representatives. As it currently looks like, there are two runoff elections in Georgia on January 5th, but I think chances are pretty good at the moment that uh, Republicans will defend those two seats. And in the House, actually, Republicans made significant gains. And maybe what's also very interesting about these gains is the the last time I looked, a majority of of the Republican candidates who won House seats, or in some cases flipped uh, House seats from Democrat to Republican, they were either members of minorities or women. So so something seems to me is is going on there in, in how the public image of the Democratic Party has changed and the, and the public image has, has uh, the public image of the Republican Party has changed. And, and without kind of putting words in your mouth, but do you think it would be justified to say that there is a tendency, at least on part of the Republicans, that they are becoming slightly more diverse, but they're actually becoming the, a, a middle class, working class party and are no longer the kind of country club conservatives as they were perceived in the past? Yes, very much. I, I think the um, the nature, the class makeup of their their base has shifted in a working class direction, um, and now I think income differences matter much less uh, for votes. I mean, obviously, it's a bit confusing, and this is one of the problems with election maps. You know, the wealthiest parts of the country are now voting for the Democrats, but at the individual level, you know, wealthy or rich or poor doesn't seem to matter that much anymore. I mean, part of the reason is is because I think the left-right economic division between you know low tax versus high spend is is becoming less important compared to the cultural divides, uh, the so-called open-close divide. You know, issues such as immigration, such as national identity, policing, uh, border security. These are much more important, uh, and they aren't so easily pigeonholed in the economic left-right. Um, but yeah, the, the minority shift to the Republicans is is an interesting one, and it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. I mean, one theory, is, I mean, there are a number of things. You know, one thing could be that the left wing of the Democratic Party, in pushing the BLM defund the police narrative, and also some of the abolish ICE, uh, you know, border security narrative, has alienated uh, sections of the um, Hispanic, Asian, and African American community, um, and I think that is one hypothesis. Uh, the other one, which I think is a possibility, is that some of these communities, which might have been uh, scared of Trump initially in 2016 because of of some of the things that were being reported and some of the things he was saying, but actually perhaps have actually become more confident and perhaps are also. Uh, acculturating, acculturating and assimilating. And we know, for example, with the Latino population, where we do have some studies uh, that it's Latinos who are more acculturated, English speaking, Protestant, um, and, and identifying as white, you know, these sorts of things, uh, they tend to be more likely to be Trump supporters. Can I interject you real quick? Because you mentioned something that, that, that I'm very curious about. There was, I think that, that was already on election eve after the results of Florida came in. I think there was a, uh, I, I don't want to talk about Twitter too much, but there was a particular tweet from a, a New York Times a journalist that said, well, that, that she's planning to write an article how Latino is an artificial concept anyways, and that Cuban Americans are actually part of the white group. And, and I think there is also now a movement that very often Asian Americans are also counted uh, among whites. And I'd be curious about your opinion. I mean, I, I, I reject a little bit the idea that they are white, but if we take a positive approach, well, that just is successful integration, isn't it? In, in a sense, like, like we no longer talk about, like nobody says that, oh, Andrew Cuomo, he's the Italian American uh, governor of, of, uh, of New York, right? He's, he's, I mean, maybe he does in a private setting, right? That occasionally you mention your Italian roots, but it's not like he would never appear as a 
a, a person of color, for example, right? And you could make the claim that you know, Italian heritage, if, if Spanish heritage makes, makes you a person of color, you could say that theoretically Italian heritage does the same, but we no longer look at, this, at it like this. Or, or Joe Biden, I think there were one or two articles that talked about this kind of Catholic past but that's nothing compared to as it was, for example, with the Kennedys, right? With the idea of a Catholic in the White House that is, you know, dual loyalty and all these kind of things. So, so it seems that one side of the political aisle, or some, and I think that that two, interestingly enough, of the far right as much as it is true of the far left, right? They are terrified of this idea that kind of we all of a sudden start to look at at few past minorities as part of the majority population. But wouldn't that be potentially a good thing, right? That people get up in the morning and say, I'm primarily American, but maybe I have roots in you know, other parts of, of, of the world, but they no longer wake up and say, I'm, again, Cuban American, and therefore I'm a completely different group from other people. I mean, the, as an optimist, one would say that's actually a positive development, or is this a too optimistic of an outlook? No, I think I think you're right. Um, I th- and, and I think this comes down to an ideological divide. I mean, I, I, I sort of argue that the U.S. doesn't really have a racial conflict, doesn't really have a racial problem. What it has is a problem of ideology where there are differences in, in attitudes about racial issues, right? So an attitude around critical race theory or defund the police or why African affirmative action or why blacks aren't getting ahead or, or how the border should be controlled you know, these have sort of various racial implications, but they are not outgrowths of having a particular racial group membership. Um, so you've got Latinos and Asians and African Americans who oppose affirmative action. That's, you know, 50 plus percent. That doesn't make them white. Uh, and likewise, a white liberal who is pro affirmative action doesn't make them black. So, but these are issues with a racial connotation. So that's the, div- the divide is actually a, an ideological one with racial symbolism rather than uh, a racial divide. And those two things are often confused. Um, but yeah, you're right about this assimilation. So then the one thing is that the American identity, and this is true in Europe too, you know, most of the people who drew, drew up the key documents, who played a key role in the uh, architecture of the, the the state and the nation were members of the ethnic majority group, and so there is an association, an implicit association, and you can show this on on association tests, these psychological tests, where how quickly can you pair, you know, a white face or a, an Asian face with the U.S. dollar bill or an eagle? Well, you know, clearly there there is a quicker association of pairing between, um, you know, a white face and these symbols. Now that doesn't mean these symbols are markers of whiteness. But what it does mean is there is a, a shadow or an implicit kind of association between the, the white group, or to be more correct about it, the white Anglo-Protestant group and American symbols. And so when the Hispanic or Asian or African-American identifies with these symbols, there is a kind of an indirect uh, identification with whiteness there. Now, it doesn't, again, doesn't mean these people are identifying as white, but it does mean that they are identifying with symbols that are implicitly associated with that white group. And that's, I think, a very important distinction. Uh, Now, of course, you then have a second stage, which is, so I think there's a lot of uh, identification with these implicitly white symbols of nationhood um, amongst minority groups. And that represents a kind of aspirational assimilation into the nation, which has a lot of these symbols that, that are ethnically associated. Uh, but then you have a second second stage, which is the melting pot stage, where you actually get intermarriage. And once somebody is half European, then they obviously have a choice to identify one way or the other. So there, there are two different levels. Um, they're both going on, and they both go on over time. Uh, and one of the reasons I think why the this argument that, well, inevitably demography is gonna to lead to the decline of, let's say the Republican party uh, is, is misguided because of this kind of vicarious white identification amongst uh, minorities via the nation state. I mean, do you think, uh, hypothetically speaking, 
if the Republican Party or, or, or the right wing in general, because I think that would partially also apply to, to Europe, at least to some countries, particularly Great Britain and France, and if they would start to play their own game of identity politics, to use an example, um, I don't think that a huge number of Republicans, for example, would have a problem with putting, I don't know, Frederick Douglass on a, on a $100 right. bill, right? So, 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 right? so I think you made this important point about symbolizing and kind of also signalize with these symbols. So I assume it will be interesting to observe over the next two and four years, are gonna, gonna Republicans gonna kind of pick up the wedge that, that Donald Trump, however he did it, right? I think that's gonna be another very interesting uh, research project that he, that he opened up the door to groups that for a long time have seemed to be beyond the reach of the Republican party. So if, if they double down on this, I, I'm just imagining what, for example, if, Tim Scott, right, the African-American senator from South Carolina, what if he would run as president or as a VP to somebody like Mike Pence? I, I mean, I, if I would be a Democrat, right, I'd be terrified of such a prospect. Yes, I mean, I do think that uh, an African-American uh, leader would gain a lot of enthusiasm in the Republican base. I mean, you saw that with Herman Cain and, and others. Um, and if you look at survey evidence, actually, uh, white Republicans do not feel particularly cool towards African-Americans. Um, it's just, in, in fact, so, so it doesn't, it's not the case that, I mean, this kind of gets to some of the research on, on attachment to own group and hatred of out group. So white Republicans are more attached to being white than white Democrats are. But really, it's the white Democrats that, that are the outliers. If you compare all racial groups and their partisanship, the only racial group who is more attached to other groups than their own racial group uh, are white Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually more the unusual ones. The white Republicans are, are you know, they're attached to being white, but they're not um, cool towards black Americans. And, and so they're actually, I think, quite willing to, I quite willing to be enthusiastic about such a person. Now, um, you know, that doesn't mean that there aren't concerns that, that white Republicans have over the pace of the scale of racial change, the pace of assimilation, border security. So yes, and those issues, of course, the Democrats will try and racialize, um, which I think is a very kind of corrosive thing to do. But um, so that is certainly racially tinged issues are very much prominent, but that's not the same as a racial conflict, as I was sort of explaining earlier, that they're they're separate things. This racially tinged ideological conflict is a second order uh, derivation. It's not first order racial conflict. It seems to me that's a little bit the problem of populist parties in general, right? That, that, that due to their populism, they, they, they attract voter groups they want to attract, right? When we say like, for example, right-wing populist, right? They want to attract the kind of the, the national conservative vote, whereas left-wing populism kind of tries to, to 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 dig into the working class and the kind of the, the the social democratic voter, if you want. But the problem with popul populism is it kind of it attracts the entire hoi polloi, if you want. But it also, of course, attracts the the radical fringe. And if if we look at the the last election, I think this has been a problem on both sides in the U.S. election. It is it is to some extent true, right, that, that Donald Trump had somewhat of a hard time. He he tried to do it more towards the end, but he had a harder time to to from the very beginning, right, to distance himself from the from the far right wing. Right? That, that was always, I don't like the expression dog whistles, I think that's an absurd concept, but there is, you don't kind of want to lose those people, right? They're not your main target, but you also want to kind of keep the, the fringe within the tent. But the same seems to me is of course true on the left as well, right? That, that, that I do not think that there are many Democrats who sincerely want to defund the police, right? Or, or, or defund ICE. But right. there is the occasional lip service to say, but we of course want to keep those people in the tent, right? So, so, so this seems to be, to be, to be an issue for for populism in general. That that how do you, kind of how do you keep the fringe in the tent without alienating the fringe? Because the energy very often is of course on the fringe. <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, I don't know that the, the fringe. I'm not sure it matters as much. I mean, certainly if you take the right. Um, the fringe like Nazi white nationalists, I don't think matter to the Republican Party or to right conservative parties. I mean, the purest, you know, race purist um, element. I, I think, however, I think there's a, a, some things that can be done. I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm of the belief that it is much more the, the, 
the values and issues. So border control, slowing down the pace of, of cultural change, um, pushing back on speech policing and political correctness. I think these sorts of things, it's the, it's the substance that, that appeals to the voters. I think the antics around lock her up and all these, yeah, I, I think a lot of what Trump does, I'm not sure that I'm less convinced that that actually powers his vote. And, and you see, again, by comparing the down ballot vote in this election with the Trump vote, the down ballot vote was uh, several points higher than the Trump vote. And I think that's evidence perhaps that, you know, you could take Trumpism and you could sort of get rid of some of the, the, the extremism and the lying and the craziness and, and actually be very successful. And similarly, with when it comes to messaging, you know, I think it would be good not to say, you know, shithole countries and, uh, you know, the things he said about Mexican rapists, you know, even if, yes, you might have meant those Mexicans that were convicted, but, you know, clearly the way the words came out was pretty bad. And I think you could have somebody who was simply focusing on, no, we're, 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 we're not, we have, there's nothing wrong with these people. You know, if I would be doing the same thing, trying to sneak across, absolutely nothing wrong with these people. But on the other hand, we have a, a very compelling interest in protecting our border and a wall is a good way to do it. That, that to me would be a, a, a sensible way and would have even greater support. So I think there are ways in which you could get away from any kind of negativity about outgroups, but you could still express positivity about in-groups and protection of the nation. Uh, and you could do it. I, and I think that that's, and partly the center right is, is starting to do that, of course, in many countries, they're sort of taking over and taming some of these elements uh, that the populace pioneered. But I think one of the most important ones is, is sort of pushing back on some of the speech policing around what you're allowed to talk about and discuss and making the case rationally, because it is very, you know, it's very easy to make this point from a free speech perspective, from the perspective of, okay, you're claiming that this is uh, racism, define racism and tell me how it's, you know, that kind of logic where you force the other side to actually get scientific and they can't do it because these are just broad brush accusations that are used to brush back the other side. You, you have mentioned, and you mentioned this already initially, and do you think that this has become even more of an issue in this election and maybe also in future elections in Europe, that it's no longer so much checkbook issues, but the, the, the so-called culture wars, they actually matter, that, that there is a frustration, we'll find out whether to, to what extent it's in the population, but that political correctness is no longer just a, a boogeyman invented by the right, right? That this is something that starts to, to, to bother people. This, this idea, you gave a very nice definition of, of political uh, correctness in one of the essays, right? That, that, that things that, that are not necessarily factually wrong, but you, you're not, not supposed to talk about them in, in polite society. In Europe, I think for now, at least 40 years, the issue has always been immigration, right? This was always, the, there has been this underlying sentiment, I would argue, among a large part of the population that was not particularly happy with overall migration policy of most European states, but it was not something you, you mentioned in, in, in polite society. And this now seems to, to really start to make an increasing impact on, on elections. Or do you think that's an overstatement? Well, yeah, I think, okay, so I think there are two things. One is that, um, I think in the US, it's definitely the case. And we have good studies now that show your attitudes to political correctness uh, are a very strong predictor of support for Trump in the primaries, for example. This was the second strongest predictor uh, was your views on political correctness. Experiments where they show the same policy, the same policy, okay, we are going to, uh, you know, should Once you put the AR racist, they get a lot of hostility blowing back in the data. And, and, or Trump is, a, when you say Trump's policies are bad or Trump's policies are racist, and when you say racist, actually support for Trump goes up. In this particular experiment that was done in 2017. And there have been a few that have been run, three, three or four studies like this. So there is what's this, this, this reaction to Trump, which helps populism. But in addition, we've also got, I think, which is more important in Europe, is the indirect effect. So and the way the indirect effect works is it's not polite to talk about what you do in polite society with the police. So the mainstream parties 
of restricting immigration. And so what you have is you've got political correctness at the elite level, which prevents a mainstream actor from articulating something that is supported by, and very often, the majority of the population. And that means there's a big market opportunity, right? So it's a bit like, I use this example of uh, the Soviet department store only selling one pair of pants, and, and uh, they don't sell anything. You, have to, you must buy this one pair. Well, the black market pops up selling the things everybody wants that the department store is supplying. And so similarly, the populist is kind of a black marketeer who's supplying the goods that people aren't getting from the government store. Uh, and that, so, so you might say, well, that's not people voting against political correctness, but in a way what it is is political correctness is having a huge impact downstream by essentially choking off the supply of uh, political messages and that opens room for the populace. Now, the, the, the other thing you, so a lot of what's happening is, is downstream effects of political correctness, which means you can't talk about immigration, you can't talk about family policy, you can't talk about crime. You can, so all of these areas uh, become off limits and that opens more space for discontent and populism to take root and divisions to take root uh, as well. Um, now, I think going forward, we may see populist parties start to directly um, campaign on sort of freedom of expression, political correctness as issues. And that's happening now. I think, you know, in Britain, we have this new uh, party reclaim with Lawrence Fox, the actor who's talking, who says this is going to be essentially about culture war, freedom of speech issues, uh, as well as national heritage, which is another battlefront opening up, you know, the knocking down of statues, the rewriting history, the the programs, the museums, all of these institutions, which are kind of being forced to be uh, very woke and politically correct and, and take things down and, and alter, in many cases, cherished traditions and history. So that becomes, again, something which, this is all quite new, but is, is something that can be politicized. You saw Trump at Mount Rushmore again. Uh, now that the left is trying to go after what it sees as kind of wrong things that were done by famous historical figures, uh, you know, Churchill, you know, all of these sorts of things, that then opens up another front. So I actually think going forward, these are going to be uh, very important symbolic issues, and they're going to play into this emerging uh, divide between the so-called open and so-called closed segments of the electorate. But do you think that also speaks a little bit actually in favor of the general electorate in, in a sense that it seems that they, you made this great comparison with the, the Soviet department store, right? That, that yeah, that if, they, if there's only one pair of pants to be to be bought, they're either gonna buy the pair of pants or they, they decide not to wear any pants at all, or you know, not going to the, the election, so to speak. That'd be the, 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 the comparative thing. But once the black market, and if we say kind of the black market is kind of these populists, once they pop up, right? Well, they're gonna go there because they offer what they have been looking for for from the beginning, if, if if it's something you would like to elaborate on, but do you think that maybe even the term populist might be by now entirely misleading? Right? It's 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 uh, as as you pointed out, right? There, there 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 are certain topics that for some people at least seem to be very important to them in, in their in their in their voting decisions. So so if the so-called established parties don't pick them up for whatever reason, one should not be surprised that they turn somewhere else. But that doesn't seem to me like how it is sometimes presented that they are duped into voting for someone. It seems that this is a very conscious decision, as you said, right? If if you're looking for, a, a, you know, a patriotic or a, a, a nationalist or whatever it is kind of party, well, once you find it, you're going to vote for it. But it's not that the person said, "Have you ever thought about nationalism?" It's more like that people said, "I would really like to vote for a nationalist," but there wasn't one until now. Yeah, I think that's right. In, in it's it depends. So, I mean, populism means a couple of things. I mean, one, it it, it can mean that you're outside the established uh, party system. So, the UK Independence Party, because it's not the Tory Party or the Labour Party, uh, might be seen as populist. Um, and that's so. In in that sense, it, it's maybe a useful word. Um, it, it could be because it's anti the established elite. Uh, which is usually part of the appeal of these parties. And so I, I, I think populism still has some 
meaning there. Sometimes it's also used to, to mean uh, appealing to the emotions rather than to hard-headed reason. But I think in all of these cases, you know, there's a gray, it's, it's shades of gray, it's not black and white. Because if you look, most parties or many parties like the Democrats in the US started out as a populist party because they introduced new classes or issues that were being ignored by the establishment. Uh, and, and, and in fact, that's how politics, democratic politics often renews itself, that issues that, that have been neglected or groups that have been neglected uh, come in on some sort of a maybe a third party movement and then that actually changes the elite parties. So now we see that the uh, mainstream conservative parties have moved, shifted to try and take some of the votes back uh, from the populace. And, and of course, that's lamented by some people, but in many ways, that is democracy in action. Now, of course, there are limits. You know, clearly, if a party says, you know, we're going to kill all the poor people, and there's a 10% of people who uh, approve of that and would vote for that, you know, clearly that's deplorable. So there are there are ethical limits here, and the and the tricky thing is to know well where when should you actually have a cordon sanitaire, and when is this legitimate normal politics? So in the U.S., the example of George Wallace, who, who wanted to keep segregation, um, I think it was quite legitimate that the main U.S. parties didn't want anything to do with that. On the other hand, um, immigration is not that kind of an issue. It's in fact quite legitimate to uh, to want to slow that the pace of immigration down. That, and, and this is where you have to actually get into the thorny uh, questions of what is and isn't racism, what is and isn't liberalism. And I think there's been a lot of kind of overreaching and concept creeping going on on the part of the uh, a lot of media and academic uh, writers who have tried who stretch these definitions because they have a certain moral wind at their you know in their back, and they've been able to just simply push and push these definitions beyond what they actually mean. So racism, you know, now anytime there's a racial disparity on any indicator, COVID, you know, uh, oh, some people died in an apartment building. This happened here in Britain. It, it burned because it was poorly constructed. It was mostly ethnic minorities. That some, somehow becomes racism. You know, so all of this kind of stretching of the meaning of racism is, and, and I think something similar happens around the immigration issue that the immediate, immediate card people go for is, Oh, you want to restrict immigration? You hate minorities, or or is, is that effectively moving to that interpretation, which is the least charitable and, and wholly unproven interpretation? Uh, that to me is sort of a fraudulent thing to do. That you need to actually allow all the issues on the table within the mainstream debate that are legitimate according to a sort of logically and empirically, scientifically applied set of principles. And I think that was missing. And it's still in many ways missing. And therefore, there's still an opportunity for populism. You wrote about this in a very recent piece in City Journal, right, under the title of Academic Freedom and Cancel Culture. I think you you you, you put your finger on, on some of the, the most bleeding areas in, in this whole debate, which is that there is, on the one hand, this kind of libertarian approach, right, kind of to keep the government and to keep uh, what you kind of call a cordon sanitaire out of this as much as possible, that ideally the best free speech situation is where everybody can just say uh, how, whatever they please. But you argue that that this might not be enough because it is kind of that this libertarian approach in some sense, not encouraged, but also made cancel culture as it is called possible. So how do you think should governments intervene kind of on without overreaching with the power, but at the same time, preserving true academic freedom. Yeah, so I think one of the mistakes that's made, I think, on the on the right is they have an affinity for deregulation and limited government. And I don't think those are necessarily bad uh, motives and, and bad instincts, but I think that they are impeding the search for a solution to the problem of, in, of institutional speech policing and political correctness, um, and particularly academic freedom. Uh, because, you know, I think there's this view somehow, and it, it might work for the media. So you could say in the media, it's a pretty freewheeling space. You've got social media, you've got, uh, you know, new publications popping up. And there you could say that good ideas will probably drive out the bad ideas. And you're, you're going to have, if, if, the New Yorker doesn't want anybody criticizing uh, 
critical race theory, then people can go off and, and Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and Andrew Sullivan and everybody can go off and have a voice and it'll still be fine. Um, but I don't think it's the same situation when we're talking about tech platforms or universities or other situations where there are very powerful first mover and network advantages. So Google got their first, they're big, big, they're, they're you know, and therefore they have a lot of power and you're not gonna come up with a new Google, call it the free speech Google that'll somehow take over from Google because there are simply too many advantages to be had by being that big. And similarly with the universities, um, they are reputate Harvard and Yale. They're not going to be elbowed aside by, you know, Trump University <laughs> or some sort of upstart because they've got endowments, they've got reputations, they have alumni, and, and there are all of these sort of reasons why these reputational and legacy and effects are so strong. The only way to reform the system is through some sort of governmental oversight, not through some kind of open market competition. And, and yet the, the, the right and the libertarians have this affinity with open market competition, um, which I think is wrong headed when it comes to these beasts, right? Uh, so what I'm trying to sort of say is if you really want to address what is a very big problem, a big injustice, which is um, that essentially there's large scale political discrimination within these institutions, which is something that I've demonstrated in, in survey work, uh, you know, that roughly a third of British academics would discriminate against a known leave supporter and 40% of US academics would discriminate, discriminate against a known Trump supporter. You know, you have this quite open, massive discrimination. And then at the same time, as a result of that, you have an incredible, incredibly powerful self-censorship. If you want to get hired and get ahead and get promoted, um, you keep your views to yourself. And not only do you keep your views to yourself, you actually don't do certain kinds of research. If you, do you want to research the phenomenon of the great awakening of, of the cultural left? Well, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, and only certain perspectives are going to be, you know, if you want something published, it's, it's easier to get it published if you have a progressive theme. And, you know, Arthur Sakamoto, the American sociologists tried to do work showing that Asian Americans face no uh, wage penalty in the labor market. He couldn't get that published anywhere. Um, however, other papers that show discrimination get in right away. So just if you want to get ahead, you're going to simply gravitate to uh, messages which, which chime with the progressive worldview. What that does is it warps the pro progress of knowledge. It, it narrows the horizons. And also it means it's impossible for uh, people to reach these accommodations across deeply held value positions. If all of the Trump supporters or Leave supporters are quiet in class, hiding it, you have actually a very unhealthy situation for the society as a whole to understand each other. Uh, and all of this, so, so this is really a, at heart the problem. The way to deal with that, I would argue, um, is you need to actually have uh, you know, a democratically elected government come in and simply say, we're going to apply the law. That's it. First, we're just going to start by saying the law says you cannot, for example, fire somebody um, for something they've researched on if it's within their free speech rights, even if, it, even if it upsets somebody. And yet universities are doing that sort of thing. So part of this is about the government's, you know, not waiting for the individual to go to the courts spend tons of money, which they don't have, lose their reputation. You know, instead of that, what you would have is a government regulator that would say, okay, every year you have to submit your reports of every, every kind of disciplinary procedure you had. Uh, and also anyone who has a free speech problem can appeal around the university to a, an independent body. All of these mechanisms, which will essentially not allow the universities to break the law, which is what they're doing um, now. So it's, it's really nothing radical. The, the other thing, of course, is university, you know, to say, well, universities should be politically neutral. Lecturers can have whatever opinion they want in class. So we're not impinging on the freedom of the individual, but we are impinging on the institutional uh, freedom to be, let's say, oh, we are a socialist university, or we are going to be a a BLM supporting university, that sort of thing, uh, 
I think should be off limits. Uh, and, and there's precedent for that already. You know, in Britain, teachers have to be politically neutral according to the law. That same thing should be applied to universities as institutions uh, and can be applied similarly with institutions like the British Broadcasting Corporation. There are ways in which you can allow journalists freedom, but at the same time monitor the, uh, the political sort of balance within the institution. I think we need to get into the, to the space that says there is a role for government to, uh, to sort of, you know, yeah, essentially to regulate for political discrimination and for um, violation of freedom of speech rights. The problem once you go for a deregulation, hands-off approach, you often hear conservative, conservatives say, oh, we'll just cut the BBC, we'll just cut the universities, no problems anymore. Well, first of all, that's almost certain not to fly <laughs> because people are gonna to wanna to go to university and somebody's gonna be providing those services. Or if you cut the BBC, the media will consist of private outlets, uh, many of whom will be even more skewed. So it's not going to solve your cultural problem. I think you need to get into the weeds, get into the the evaluation of content, of political content, of political discrimination, and actually start to apply the law. And there's some good precedents, by the way, for this. So one is just if you look at what the US government did with the universities in the southern US in the sort of early 1960s when they wouldn't admit black students, they were compelled to admit black students to uphold the rights of those students to choose which university they wanted to go to. So it's, a, it's the government limiting the rights of institutions like universities to protect the rights of individuals. And similarly with um, heavily Muslim schools here, that were captured by Islamists who, who were imposing uh, certain sex norms on the uh, schools while the government comes in, takes the school away from this cliques, puts it into special measures. So it's violating the right of the school to run its own affairs, but doing that in the interest of the right of say female students to have their freedom back. And so I think there's a very strong precedent for this kind of activity. Universities, for example, um, are under the, the capture or an, under the pressure from a social justice activists who are in the university professoriate, they're in the student body, can pressurize the university. That requires an outside intervention in order to check their power to restore the freedom of the individuals within the university. Do you think, because this, this, this fits quite nicely to the, some of the, the points you just made now towards the end of the segment, that the legal side is one, right? Is 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 one one aspect, but is it also at least partially a cultural issue, right? That the society either has a a, a value commitment to free speech, to academic freedom, to open debate, or they or they don't. And it seems that gradually politics, really, and I think that's also true in Europe. We don't see it probably that much because it's it's it doesn't involve like a deity or some divine figure. But politics in many areas is getting an almost religious like. Uh, uh, treatment and and the other thing which which might be I'm simplifying here a little bit is is it also something like intellectual laziness in in, in the sense of we live in a very kind of self gratifying age or, or an age where where immediate gratification is sought wherever possible so it's much easier to join you know an an online mob or mob is a strong word but you know kind of to 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 dish out in 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 like the most egregious way than actually engage with someone who has a different opinion, right? Which can, which, that probably means more writing. It means more research. You actually have to, to engage with somebody's argument. It's, it's easier to, to say, shut up than, than, than to say, okay, here is why I think, you know, point one is wrong and point two is wrong. So, so it's, it's, it's a kind of combination of, of religious like attitudes combined with, for lack of a better word, something like intellectual laziness, which particularly I would say at universities is a frustrating thing to, to observe. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, I, I guess I sort of see it more as, as you know, in every age you have a, a dogma or, or um, some sort of an inquisition, as an orthodoxy. Uh, now, at one, at one time it might have been religion, um, you know, through much of human history. Those were the taboos. And briefly there was communism in the U.S. case that was the, you know, Communism was anti-communism was the sort of crusade, and anybody and everybody could be called a communist. 
Um, but now we're in a situation where there's a new religion um, which is in place. And therefore, you know, in all of these situations, people are going to want to shut down dissent. They're going to want to shut down anyone who is blaspheming the religion. Um, and so the religion now is what uh, uh, John McWhorter would call the religion of anti-racism. It's essentially about race, number one, then gender and sexuality and any sort of anything that can be construed uh, often dishonestly as racist, gen you know, sexist or, or, or homophobic or whatever. Um, that is a charge that silences the conversation. And, and the reason it works is because uh, to some degree, people have drunk the Kool-Aid and buy into this religion, um, you know, that is, and, and the religion ultimately comes from myths and stories that are developed and that are powerful in movies, in literature and, and so on. And so the, the big stories say in, in Europe, it would be uh, colonialism and the Holocaust in the United States, it would be slavery and Jim Crow, and it might be uh, the treatment of the uh, First Nations, American Indians, you know, or in Canada would be the, particularly in Canada, the uh, where I'm from, you know, we, again the, the Native Indians and the residential school system and all of so, so these sorts of powerful uh, stories, which become almost the defining stories that all of the particularly younger people are inducted into through movies. You know, who is the who is the bad guy in the morality plays of of our generation? It's almost always going to be, you know, kind of the the white southerner or the Nazi or, you know, so this is sort of what people uh, are brought up in. And, and I don't have an, a, a huge problem with using that, those stories, because these were really awful people. But at the same time, you don't have stories about the Chinese Cultural Revolution and Stalinism and, and the equally awful things that they did in the guise of um, making a utopia of equality. You know, that is not something that we have movies about or many movies about, it's not something you'll know about. So there's no check on those emotions. And the problem then occurs, you know, what we then find is you have this very sort of, um, you know, high sensitivity to anything that could even be remotely construed as racist, uh, you know, and, and so that then is a taboo, which can then be stretched. And uh, this, this idea of the concepts being creeping outward and outward and outward, to shut down debate and being so holy and sacred that they trump free speech, which doesn't have a sacredness. I mean, we don't really learn about the fight for habeas corpus in Britain and the and press freedom in the 18th century and, and the struggles for uh, religious liberty necessarily. We don't actually have a lot of popular cultural movies and, and songs and, and, and plays about those sorts of things. And so the instinct for the emotional instinct for liberty is quite subdued uh, and it isn't really alive in the same way the instinct for anti-racism is uh, and so therefore the anti-racism is going to trump the you know at an emotional level it's simply more powerful it's going to trump all of the no one you know if every school child was made to read George Orwell's 1984 and that were to be in movies uh, you know it would have a more powerful resonance and we might have a check against this but Right now, I think the fundamental problem is is a values problem that certain narratives are more powerful. I mean, I would be amiss, right? I think uh, because I think this fits quite nicely into this in this conversation. If we wouldn't talk at least a little bit in the time we have remaining about your most uh, recent books, one uh, from 2010, if I'm not mistaken, was titled "Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth: Demography and Politics in the 21st Century," and more recently. Uh, the book titled White Shift, Populism, Immigration, and the Future of White Majorities. Could you, for our listeners, just summarize a little bit the main thesis of these books and, and kind of where you think that, uh, that what you formulated there, where it currently stands? Well, yeah, so the, the Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth, which is the first, my first trade press book, which is, it's essentially um, a political demography of religion. What does that mean? It, it is essentially arguing that, um, when we're thinking about whether uh, the world will become more secular or more religious, it's not just enough to think about conversion, people moving away from religion to non-religion, for example, uh, but we need to sort of look at um, who's having children because the most common way for people to get religion is the old-fashioned way, through birth. And yeah. so 
what's happening with religion is very strongly tied to global demographic patterns. Uh, and you know, almost basically 98% of the world's population growth is taking place in the developing world, which is both 95% religious um, and, and has higher fertility. So that is where the world's population growth is coming from. The decline is coming entirely from the secular parts of the world in East Asia, Western Europe, et cetera, increasingly North America. Uh, so the secular parts of the world are, are demographically declining and the religious parts are growing. But even within the, say, in the West, I just saw a study recently, and again, this is just one more data point, that if you look at, um, you know, if you look at cons you know, Republican and Democrat counties in the United States and you look at birth rates, uh, or even oh, no. that it's, it's very much the case, um, it's very much the case that people who are uh, practicing uh, religious believers, particularly if they're fundamentalists, will have a significant birth rate premium. And that actually matters. And it matters cumulatively over time, especially if the children remain within the religion. Uh, and the stronger the religion, the more likely the kids are to stay in the religious faith, because leaving the faith is a big step. And, and, and so examples like the Amish and the ultra-Orthodox Jews, these are groups that are basically having you know, a population explosion uh, to the point where now, you know, one third of the Jewish first grade class in Israel is ultra orthodox now. Over, and that was like a few percent in 1960. Uh, and, and in the book, I talk about the Amish. Well, you know, by you know, in 200 years, there'll be 300 million of them in the United States. You know, so now, of course, who knows? Maybe something will come along that will interrupt that. But right now, it's not clear. The Amish have been growing at that rate for 100 years. So why would that not continue? And, and so, yeah, just try to raise questions around religious fertility and its impact on politics. And Israel is the case where you already see the ultra-Orthodox parties increasing their share. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you one thing? Because this, there is, there is, there, there have been two competing arguments, if you will. One was that that uh, one reason why why birth rates have declined among the non-religious is because it's also combined. With, with higher income, right? As people get richer, as they get more wealthy, they leave religion and then they also have, have few, fewer children. Now, would it be, and, and uh, again, that there's some data pointing in that, that direction, but I'm, I'm not sure where I myself come down on, but could it also be that it's not so much the, 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 the better numbers of the bank account, so to speak, but that the idea of secularism is culturally connected to having fewer children. Right. There was a, a radio host recently who is of uh, himself um, an Orthodox Jew. He kind of told the somewhat amusing story. They said when, when his mother had three children and, and somebody in the supermarket asked her, how many children do you have? And she said three, right? People were saying three, well, that's a lot. And when she went to a religious community and, 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 and they asked her, how many children do you have? And she said three, their answer was, well, what would happen to the other four? So <laughs> that it's, it's not so much, uh, so, so, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the rationalist mind says, yes, people, they get richer. We no longer work in agriculture. We need fewer children for economic reasons, so we don't have more children. But another argument could be that the shift to, to secularism led to, to fewer children because being secular almost implies, exactly as, as it is in this tiny story, is there is once again what we talked about also with the Trump voters, right? There is a social disability issue here. If if you are, you know, middle class or upper class secular and you would have five children, people might, you know, look at you surprised to put it to put it this way. So what do you think? Is it is it more economics or is it more culture? Yeah, I think it is very much more culture, and that's now increasingly well established in the uh, demography literature, this with the second demographic transition theory that it used to be economics mattered a lot for how many kids you could have, particularly surviving kids. Uh, but now that fertility is a choice and there's contraception, um, is very much down to values and, and what you value and don't value. Uh, and so that is why religion is more important now. In the past, it wasn't very important because everybody just had large families, many kids died, whatever. Now it's a choice and they all survive. Well, religion matters a lot. Um, so I now I think there's a 25% in the latest cohort uh, fertility advantage in the US case to, um, 
I, I'm trying to remember if this is conservative, liberal, or, or religious, non-religious, but seculars, it's sort of between a quarter and a half child lower uh, controlling for ethnicity and everything else uh, in, in the West. Um, yeah, this is a very significant gap. Uh, and it is I, it's very much tied into worldview, as you said, you know, this idea of to what extent is a woman's role tied up with motherhood? To what extent is uh, do you buy into something like go forth and multiply and, and, and these sorts of biblical passages? Um, yeah, that, that does matter. And, and, and I think secularism tied more to individualism. Now, of course, you can have secular nationalism. And to some extent in Hungary and, and in other places, that is being used to try and increase the birth rate. Whether it works as effectively, who knows? It has a mixed record. And this brings us to, to the other book you wrote about is, is a migration into Europe. Can I uh, just want to, for our listeners, read once again the title, White Shift, Populism, Immigration, and the Future of White Majorities. What is the main thesis of, of this work of yours? Well, the main thesis really is that we are in our century going through a sort of very important decline in the share of nation state population made up of ethnic majorities. Um, so, you know, white Americans in the United States, uh, ethnic English in Britain, uh, ethnically uh, German people in Germany, et cetera. So those are, they are all declining because of a combination of low fertility uh, and increasing immigration or, or high levels of immigration. And what that does is it shifts the nature of politics from uh, conflicts over the economy to conflicts over culture with immigration a key symbol of this. So if we want to understand uh, the rise in uh, right-wing populism, this is the key underlying dynamic. Now, of course, there's other things going on, you know, one of which is this rise of uh, cultural left liberalism, which is in some ways responsible, first of all, for the opening up of borders, but is also responsible for some of the speech restrictions uh, at the elite level, which have allowed, in a sense, have constrained the main parties and allowed for the right-wing populists to succeed. So those are the two factors, the demographic shift and also the ascent of this cultural left liberalism post 1960s. Um, but the other thing too I talk about longer term is, so you're gonna have these declining ethnic majorities. This is in my view going to lead to an increasingly uh, cultural form of politics and, and, and polarization and then, but. But next century, we may have a resolution insofar as you're going to get large scale melting uh, and mixed race majorities emerging, which, which I argue are going to largely cohere around the existing ethnic majority myths and, and uh, stories of peoplehood and collective memories. So I, I, I would argue for a more assimilationist outcome rather than a multiculturalist diversity based outcome where everybody's looking to their own separate. Uh, homelands and separate traditions. I mean, there, there I have to touch, uh, because I think this is such a fascinating topic. Do you, uh, would you think that this kind of happens almost on its own or that this will take, just as we talked pre previously about, about academic freedom and cancel culture, that maybe some government intervention be necessary. I was recently looking at, at, you look at the emergence of the nation state in Europe. And, and there you can see that there was, whether it was done with that purpose in mind or it just kind of happened because there was this, this nationalist elite culture, but there was like, there was this formation of there is just one uh, national language, right? So, so in France, for example, the military spoke the, I think it was like the Parisian French. It didn't, it, when you were from Normandy or somewhere else, sure, you had, you had your dialect, but it was no longer recognized as an, as a unique language. Similarly in Italy, right? Then also this, this, this in, in German, like with Leopold von Ranke, this kind of nationalist history writing, which was not factually wrong. It just had a very strong emphasis on that the entire course of history, right, since Roman times was almost predetermined to then <laughs> emerge in the German nation state. So, so people were kind of imbued for, for better or worse, right? I think nationalism, of course, on its own is, is a, 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 an ambiguous topic. We, you know, as Joran has only rights, right? There are some who say that nationalism is a virtue, others say it, so all these kind of things. But in general, do you think this vision that, that, that gradually this assimilation will happen, is it enough kind of to lean back and just say, let's look at this, it's gonna happen, or will there be some government action necessary? And I'm asking this particularly because when we look at, at, at Muslim integration, it seems that 
previous generations have been better integrated than, than current generations? And, and could we say, this is a far stretch, but that simply the inactivity, the, the, the not fostering, and you said this before, right, the, 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 the dominant stories, right? It's not so much that the, what's, what's, what's factually right and wrong, but which one of these stories is dominating, right? Every, every country has its, 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 its dark spots in history, but the question is, what are we emphasizing in public schools? What are we emphasizing in the public debate, right? It, it's kind of, um, we, we all know that, for example, our mothers have probably flaws, but we still perceive them as being the best mothers in the world, right? It's not just because it satisfies an emotional need, but it's also, it would be psychologically very difficult if you constantly would focus on the negative, which doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just kind of for psychological health, you focus more on the positive. But it seems to me that that, that nationalism, you can say in, in its most beneficial interpretation is something similar, right? That you say, of course, there are, there are Muslim Germans and there are Germans of, of, of Turkish descent. But again, if they primarily identify as German, that's not going to be a problem. But if we create the cultural environment where being German is already viewed suspiciously or kind of as, as a potential negative thing, why as a Turkish immigrant would I ever voluntarily assimilate into, between quotation marks, a self-hating culture? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think this is an important point you make is there needs to be a kind of confidence uh, in in a particular cultural and particular national narrative that, I mean, I do think that the there are two things going on here. One is the assimilation into the nation and the other is the assimilation into the ethnic majority, which is which happens through intermarriage. There's two different levels and they are both actually important. Um, now, but of course, you don't need to have everybody melting into the ethnic majority, but you do need to have, I think, a, a critical mass uh, of that ethnic majority, or else your politics takes on a very different kind of feel, sort of what we see in places like Guyana uh, or, or, you know, or Mauritius, where you have, it doesn't mean it doesn't work, but you have ethnic politics and, and, and a sort of more polycentric society, which I think doesn't work as well. I think if you, so... Um, but but yeah, the role for government, I I mean, there's there's two issues. One is the, I mean, in terms of integration, I I, I am not persuaded that I've seen a lot of very useful pol integration policies. I think this is not entirely the case, but it's not obvious to me that say the French Republican model does a better job uh, than the American or the British model. Um, I think these are very abstract things. They don't affect things on the ground very much. Um, but the main thing is to remove any obstacles to integration. So if you do have a school that is controlled by Islamists or that is segregating the sexes, you know, you want to step in and ensure that's not occurring. So you want to take out the obstacles to integration. I don't think you can force integration. That will that does take time. It takes generations uh, in many cases. So I think it is more of an organic process, but you can remove the obstacles. The other thing is on history teaching, I totally agree with you that the problem we have now is that there is such a focus on the so-called critical approach to history, which comes from uh, the university system, where the incentives were to sort of initially to go against the popular nationalistic narrative. That's where, where the incentive was. And now this has become, that sort of critical approach has become the establishment in the education system. So you yes, you need to kind of rebalance back towards a more, a, a kind of history that says, you know, there were some things that, that we did wrong, but the good, we want to focus on the good. It's a bit like I might have stolen from a store when I was 10 years old, um, but am I going to wake up in the morning and just hang my head in shame about that one episode and let it define me? Well, no, I'm going to actually focus on, uh, you know, the successes I've had and the, the things that I've achieved and so on. I think that's only natural for a healthy individual as a healthy nation. Now, of course, one thing I do advocate in the book is you do want to allow a certain amount of choice, like choosing onto a menu, for example. So it may be that a Turkish German identifies with certain symbols of Germany more, maybe with their urban neighborhood or football or whatever, more than somebody uh, in rural Germany who might identify with the countryside as being central to their German identity, or, or even historically, there may be different 
episodes that different people identify with, but as long as they're identifying as being German or being British or whatever, uh, they can do it their own way. I think that's perhaps a better way than the French Third Republic, everyone must sing from the same sheet uh, approach. So you want to have some flexibility in there, perhaps, with, with nationhood this time around. Um, but I agree with you, the, the approach that sort of focuses on the negatives and attempts to sort of make it all about uh, equality and diversity, I think that is really divisive and, and isn't really a way forward. Final question, because this I think this this rounds it out quite nicely. I've been been playing around with 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 kind of with this idea, but particularly when we look at, at at teaching also history in public schools and and the 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 Austrian emperor in, in I mean, that's quite a time ago. But for example, his 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 personal guard very often consisted of of Bosniaks, which were which were Muslims from the Balkans. And and I'm sometimes wondering if, if particularly in in schools, similarly as it is in Britain, right, where you have a, a high percentage, in Austria at least, people from the Balkans, people with uh, of of Muslim faith, I'm wondering if we couldn't use those historical episodes to then create something that binds people together, right? It, I think it's it's exactly as you say. I don't think as you as you point out, you cannot force integration, but if if and then we are think back into into this idea of storytelling in in the sense of 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 creating a, a common a commonality, which would be so right. There might be Austria, but here is the the, the positive role, right, that, that Islam has played, or, or or how Muslims were part of of Austrian history in in a, in a constructive, positive way, right. Same with the U.S. This is why I always like to mention Frederick Douglass, right. There is there is something like black patriotism or, or black nationalism, whatever you want to call it. And I think you recently also saw it a couple of. Um, of, of black members of parliament in, in in Great Britain, right, who came out strongly for 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 something as a unified British identity, and I think this is exactly what you say. It's kind of, it's you said it nicely. It's it's a menu, but it's even even on this menu, it's not just picking, uh, you know, one dish. It's kind of picking a combination that 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 then, then makes makes the whole thing. And this is a little bit, I think, what I exactly what you said. What, what's missing in public education? It's not so much stories about heroes and villains. It would be much nicer if they would tell the stories of successful integration in the past. Yeah, I think that's absolutely absolutely correct. I think the uh, you know, and you can see, say, in in the Sikh community here that they identify with the the Sikh regiments that fought in the world wars on the British in the British army. That's important to them. It's less important to the younger Sikhs, but. Uh, you know, that's an example of where you can make a connection that way. Uh, but the way I would, I, I think it's important to have that, you know, with the teaching of history where you would have some modularity where people could write on things that interested them. And maybe the, the Sikh students would write on those Sikh regiments more. Um, we shouldn't, of course, underestimate the capacity for someone of a different race to identify with, with you know, so... You know, an Italian American identifying with George Washington and Anglo Saxon, no one really questions that anymore. Um, and act, so I don't think we should necessarily question the ability of somebody who is black to identify with someone who is white, for example, because they are proud of their country. Um, and, and, but at the same time, you do want to have some, I think, modularity and where you can include these positive stories. I mean, one of the problems is this gets to a fundamental ideological debate uh, that some the sort of critical left approach is to always highlight what is different and what is unfair. And, and the sort of, I think ultimately there is some scope for, you got to have some scope for that, but I think it is too dominant. I think there is the, the emphasis on what people have in common. So something like assimilation is a dirty word uh, on the left, this idea, you know, who has written a book about, I always ask this question, has anyone written, first of all, advocating the benefits of assimilation as a minority? Uh, I'm an assimilated person, and this is my story. I mean, you don't see that kind of work going on. Uh, there is no sort of uh, storytelling and um, lionizing and lauding of, of people who assimilate. I mean, this is seen as just if it's looked upon at all, it's looked upon as a terrible thing. Um, and that comes out of that radical kind of cultural left worldview, which emerges in the early 20th century. And so what we need to do is really rebalance where we have to say, actually, that is a perfectly valid uh, way to be. You can retain your own heritage and, and stay apart, but equally, 
um, assimilating is a noble thing to do, and we're not going to privilege staying apart over assimilating. Th that kind of um, rebalancing, I think, needs to happen. All right, Eric, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I apologize. It went a little okay. longer than, than initially planned, but the topics were just uh, too important and your insights too valuable to, to cut it short.